good morning. Welcome to this course on layered uh, no cross flow reservoirs and rate time analysis. And it will be taught by Mike Fetkovich. Um, many of you, I think, have read papers that uh, Mike has written over the years. He's uh, now retired from Phillips, but as is on the overhead, he's a Phillips fellow emeritus. He's had an illustrious career with Phillips. He's worked extensively on the chalk fields here in Norway and on uh, the sandstone reservoirs as well, uh, from the well test all the way through the reservoir analysis and the prediction cases. Several studies that uh, have been completed both here in the UK, uh, for instance on Hewitt, Mike worked from uh, at the outset on the unitization of the Hewitt unit and did some excellent work on that that's carried on through the years. And recently in the States with the uh, Huguet and Gasfield, the work that's been carried on analyzing the uh, layered reservoir with no cross flow characteristics and its impact and impact on infill drilling, whether or not that's necessary. Mike's here to share with us this morning his experience uh, that he's gained over these years with Phillips. A lot of insights which frankly have not been picked up uh, that readily by the industry uh, simply due to awareness or whatever. But nonetheless we have the benefit of his experience and he's here to share it with us over the next three days. And I'd like to uh, warmly welcome Mike to Stavanger and uh, wish that uh, we all have a very enjoyable and a profitable uh, course uh, over this time. Here, Mark. I'll let you pass that out. The time I was here, it was in 1989. And uh, uh, prior to that, I used to come over very frequently. And you know, a lot of the uh, places here and uh, the faces have changed. So I probably don't recognize anybody uh, left here anymore. But. Uh, 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 I'd like to it's sort of given well let's go into this here a little bit uh, the first part we're going to talk about uh, basic concepts in decline curve analysis mainly get to get you oriented to to the layer no cross flow uh, reservoir concepts and as you can see here there's a Phillips shield uh, I retired in uh, uh, the end of June last year uh, in Phillips had made uh, a new title for me uh, a Phillips Fellow Emeritus. I never knew what that meant. I, I Emeritus. I thought that was some kind of distinguished uh, professor at a university and I found out all it means is retired. You know that's all it means. So. <laughs> I'm retired. They uh, they wanted me to be associated yet with Phillips, even though I retired. Uh, I still live in Bartlesville. Uh, emeritus means they provide me an office and a telephone and a secretary, uh, what have you, for I guess as long as I live, <laughs> uh, which I hope is a long time. But uh, they've also uh, provided me since I'm in Bartlesville, asked me to be. Uh, under contract with them, uh, which I am. Uh, uh, it's a yearly thing. Either they decide they don't want me anymore, or I decide I don't want them anymore. But but it's a uh, it's a way to ease into retirement. Uh, 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 well, they're separate items, though. The the uh, emeritus means I'm going to uh, at least be associated with Phillips for as long as I live. And I guess you're aware they also made available. Um, uh, Reservoir Engineering Award that they're they're going to give annually, and I know uh, that we've had at least a couple nominations here from Stavanger and uh, a few from the states, and uh, a couple from the UK. Uh, uh, you passed out a book here that has uh, uh, at least the first part uh, is a copy of all of the uh, overheads that I'm going to show today. Uh, and I've got notes on there that that uh, you may want to add to yourself uh, because every time I give it, it's a little different. Uh, 
Uh, one thing that I tried to do with this session was to allow more time to try and be more methodical and deliberate about what I'm going to say. Because uh, usually I give this as a uh, Society of Petroleum Engineers uh, seminar in Houston. I've given it in Oklahoma City and uh, Dallas, and uh, uh, it takes a full day. And because I'm on a time crunch, I always kind of go pretty fast. And I really don't want to do that here. I'd like to get it uh, to be slow and methodical. And if you have any questions along the way, ask them if I can give the clarification. And I'd like to take more time on each of the overheads to make sure that I cover everything that uh, I want to cover. And I guess the other aspect here is uh, we've got a video camera here. Uh, I hope it doesn't inhibit me. I'm going to uh, eliminate all the jokes <laughs> you know, because we're going to, uh, 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 except I guess we can edit some of the, uh, at least the bad jokes out. <laughs> so, like I say, uh, I'd like to be slow and methodical, so uh, uh, we'll be patient. Uh, 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 here's sort of an agenda that uh, I tried to prepare. It was passed out, and this is Reservoir Engineering uh, course. That's what it is, really. And uh, very seriously, I'm going to give you 38 years of my experience uh, in three days. And if you understand everything that's in the book and everything I say, you've got 38 years' experience. You can quit going to consulting business. And uh, there's a lot here. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ramey uh, of Stanford, I'm sure that you've all heard of him if you've been in reservoir engineering or uh, in pressure transient analysis, it, uh, it indicated to me that even some of the very best concepts in papers, when they're published, it's a minimum of uh, 10 years before they're utilized. The rate time stuff has been out now since about 1973. And they started picking up uh, 10 years ago, but it's uh, about 20 years, and I find it is starting to be used uh, extensively now. That uh, uh, It is a powerful tool, and it was only through uh, the understanding of uh, rate time analysis and performance data that existed in that region that we were able to kind of discover layered no cross flow reservoir behavior and its implications. Uh, and again, I hope to go over that with you uh, kind of in detail. Uh, there's a lot of potential for increased production and reserves if you understand what's going on. And uh, the first day we're going to cover uh, uh, basically rate time decline. And again, I'm going to try and throw in while we're going through it, uh, uh, it's bearing on uh, uh, layered no cross flow reservoir behavior. Uh, at the beginning, we'll give you some of the historical background of rate time analysis, and we'll show you how, for gas wells, you can exactly derive the arcs equations uh, of rate time decline. Remember, the only or, or, the only reason anybody in this room exists really is to make production forecasts for uh, for oil and, ca uh, and gas reservoirs, or to confirm them. The, uh, you know, th that's why we're in the business. You make the forecast. You're going to see if, uh, uh, if you're going to develop a field or not, what the economics are. Uh, you furnish them to other people, but the drilling engineers, the, the geologists, everybody is working towards obtaining the data to make a production forecast to see if you're going to develop a reservoir. That's what it's all about. And that's what rate time analysis is about. That uh, There's been a lot of emphasis over the years in uh, pressure transient analysis, but the only the application of the numbers that you get is to make a production forecast uh, or to analyze the data in terms of the, uh, these wells need the stimulation and I can increase the production rates of function of time. You know, so this is what it's all about. And you, uh, you really uh, uh, will never realize the impact of the data that you're, or that you're getting from the pressure transient until you take that data and make a production forecast. You know, like uh, uh, if you've ever done any pressure transient analysis, you think, well, if I pick an H of uh, 100 feet or 50 feet, 
that's going to only change the K by a factor of two, you know, so that's in the ballpark. Actually, when you're picking an H, you're setting the oil and gas in place. And, and uh, to make a forecast with half the amount that's there is uh, a drastic uh, a change in, in the economics of a project. So you're not, when you pick an H, you're not just uh, determining K. You're determining the oil or gas in place. And well, uh, 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 even though it may seem like we're talking about individual wells here in a lot of situations, we're, uh, uh, you, uh, the whole analysis procedure, the concepts apply to fields, uh, uh, the total field. Uh, some of this will come out that, that uh, we'll define or we'll try and explain what the variables in the ARPS uh, decline analysis or equations mean. Uh, well, the D sub I is nothing more than the gas or the potential of the well divided by the gas in place. That's all it is. Uh, a lot of engineers, uh, like in the States or, or geologists, will try and, and uh, justify the drilling of an infill well or something, and they'll say, I'll pick a 10% decline rate. Well, they're just grabbing that out of the air. You can calculate exactly what it should be if you have an idea of the oil or gas in place and what the permeability is or if you're going to stimulate. You, you can exactly calculate that number. It's not an arbitrary number that, that you grab out of the air. And that's what I indicate here that we're going to try and develop the physical meaning of the Q sub I, the D sub I, and the exponent B. Uh, they can all be calculated rigorously. And, and, and I'll show you Again, there's only two uh, fundamental equations for reservoir engineering, and that's the rate equation and the material balance equation. That's all there is. There's a transient period, but that normally isn't really significant. Uh, and I can treat a field by an average well times the, uh, the number of wells in. You know, so everything uh, is very simple. And uh, it was the understand, or, uh, with the fact I worked in gas. Uh, at the beginning of my career, the uh, single phase flow. You can separate all the fuzz, you know, all uh, the snow from uh, multi-phase flow in reservoirs. And it turns out one of the uh, papers I published, the isochronal testing of oil wells, and there's an example, at least one example in that paper, which is in the book, that uh, we ran an isochronal test of uh, the initial discovery well of Ecofisk. Uh, and the whole concept is that I can express the, you know, the rate equation for oil wells just exactly like gas wells, exactly the same way, a difference in pressure squared relationship. Uh, production engineers may be familiar and say, well, we use the Vogel equation, uh, Fetkovich, the answers are very, no, there's more to it than that. It's if you understand that oil wells behave as a difference in pressure squared relationship, the impact of an assumption of a flowing pressure is minimal, okay? Uh, a lot of people think it, well, uh, it depends what you pick. Uh, uh, if you worked in gas, you find out uh, if you square the shutting pressure of 2,000 pounds and then you square a flowing pressure of 500 or 200 or 100 or, or 1, the, uh, the difference in rate when, when you're working with a difference in pressure squared is zilch. I mean, you can't even plot it. Uh, 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 on a graph paper. So it, uh, it's that concept uh, that tells you the impact uh, uh, of some of the things that you might worry about. Engineers have a tendency to worry about precision and accuracy. As a reservoir engineer, I've learned I want to know the answer, like the permeability within an order of magnitude. Is it one millidarcy, is it 10, or is it 100? Uh, 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 well, to me, if it's one, two, or three, it's the same answer because I can make a lot of uh, reservoir engineering uh, judgments on the basic level of permeability. You know, if you're working in the area uh, permeability, say the one, the two, uh, even 10 millidars, you can't have water influx, okay? The permeability is too low. Uh, uh, so when I look at a pressure cume that may be curved, if you tell me the level of permeability, I'll tell you whether it's a transient if it's water influx or if it's layered no cross flow reservoir. 
this is how you look at performance. That, that, that you need to build up uh, certain very simple concepts, and then you can make immediate judgments about about uh, uh, the impact or uh, a reservoir performance. And uh, if you listen to everything that uh, I'm trying to say, plus if you read the or uh, if you look at the overheads and you, uh, you, uh, you read the papers, you, uh, you'll see all this stuff is in there somewhere. Uh, it's hidden. And you, the nice thing to hear somebody talk is that at least gives you an idea of uh, some of the basic concepts, then it's a thousand times easier to read it. One of the things I had a tendency to do in uh, writing papers was, uh, you know, everybody's told me, uh, out there in industry or, or in academia, that they're too long. Well, they have a lot of concepts in there. They may have uh, uh, the fundamental approach to writing a technical paper is uh, to introduce one concept. Okay, a lot of my papers you'll find uh, a ten, a twenty uh, a concepts in one paper. Uh, the reason is I worked in industry and I had a lot of things to do, but when you're writing a paper you focus real hard on a particular subject. If I didn't write everything then, I was never going to write it again. You know, so that's the excuse that I have for the long papers and, and uh, or the complicated. If I didn't get it down then, it would never be written again. Okay, So you understand where I'm coming from from that standpoint. Uh, the concept that the, uh, uh, the B decline on the rate time is a reflection of uh, recovery efficiency or the drive mechanism. I hope you get to cover that. You know, it has physical meaning. Uh, the development of the type curve that I came up with where I combined the ARPS uh, empirical equations with the uh, constant wellbore pressure solution. And you know, everybody says, but we don't produce reservoirs constant. Uh, at a constant pressure. Well, in, uh, in pressure transient analysis or build up uh, analysis, you don't produce a well at a constant rate either, so don't worry about it. The important thing is it'd be smooth and monotonic type behavior, and you can analyze uh, uh, without any worries by a normalization process, which is exactly equivalent to rigorous superposition. It took us years to try and get engineers out uh, testing wells to stop going out and keep screwing with the choke, you know. You keep trying to increase the rate. They either uh, come up with a big rate or they say, well, the pressure buildup will be more accurate if I can produce at a constant rate during the drawdown. The only way I can do that was to mess with the choke. Well, you screw everything up, okay? Uh, uh, that's the worst thing that you can ever do on a test is to uh, I, I mess with the choke. You know, just leave it at a a fixed choke and record uh, with the rates and the pressures with time and you can do a uh, rigorous analysis of the drawdown data and the build up data. In, uh, in fact you'll find if you take the good data your drawdown data is probably better than your build up data from a reservoir engineering standpoint. But uh, what we used to do when we'd analyze it, like all the echo fisk wells, you go back I don't know uh, if the folders are here, but we analyzed every drawdown and every build up and every bomb uh, that was run in a well, like we'd run three. We analyzed them all. You can't skip over it, you know, because everything has to make sense. If you analyze the drawdown and the build up, you get different answers, you got a problem because you better get the same answer. Uh, uh, if you have different rates and different build up, you better get the same answer. Uh, and if you can't do that, there's there's something wrong. Uh, either with your analysis or there's a new problem to solve. Okay. Uh, you go back and look at all of the papers I've ever written. Every single one was written after I solved a problem for Phillips. Never written before. It was after I solved a problem for Phillips. You know that always came first. So they're all based on uh, field data, and I find out. Uh, talking to people with academia and even industry, I guess that's one of the things that they appreciate uh, in all my papers. They're all based on field data. And, and, and I can guarantee you that the premises and assumptions that are built into uh, in, uh, in many study, reservoir studies and models, the results are based on those premises, which may or may not be real. 
and, and uh, if you don't fit the, the field data, then something's wrong with your model, or your whole concept of reservoir engineering. Just as an example, there, uh, I'll cover it here, but as an example, uh, uh, every full water drive oil reservoir that I've ever seen has a decline exponent B of 0.5, okay? So I approached uh, a friend of mine and said, hey, uh, I wonder why this is happening. He said, well, I'll set up a model. I'll run it and we'll find out why. Well, we'll look at different relative terms and so on and so forth. So he did and he ran all, all of these cases and he said, hey, no matter what I run, I get exponential instead of a B of 0.5. There must be something wrong with your data. Uh, think about that for a little bit. There's something wrong with the premises that are set uh, in running some models. That's the problem. Now, the field data is trying to tell you something. We'll go through a lot of uh, field examples with uh, a detailed discussion of each. Uh, you'll see that there are several that come from the Ecofisc area. You'll also see that there are uh, quite a few that come from the states, but you know it's the whole concept uh, of dimensionless solutions is it's valid everywhere in the world. You know, the, uh, I'm sure you people who do uh, pressure transient analysis, you use the type curve. That's a dimensionless uh, solution, the PDTD. How many of you do pressure transient analysis? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, because the other thing. Uh, it was the basic understanding of the concept of uh, uh, pressure trance analysis, the type curve and superposition uh, that led to the understanding of uh, rate time. Because rate time is if you take the PDTD curve and you just flip it upside down, that's rate time. So there isn't anything new to learn. You know, that's how you make the transition very quickly. That uh, QD is equal approximately year to 1 over PD. So everything I know about pressure transient analysis, I can immediately apply yet to rate time analysis. I can take the same data, normalize it. Uh, you plot it either as a, a constant uh, wellbore pressure type uh, data, and it'll fit that solution. And the same data, you take the tracing paper and flip it, uh, you flip it over, and it'll fit the PDTD or, uh, or the QDTD. You know, so. The, I'll show you an example of that, but you have to understand the implications that there is really nothing new to learn uh, if you understand uh, a pressure transient analysis. You just apply the concepts. Uh, well, the second day we're going to get into a, a full day of uh, depletion performance of layered reservoirs without cross flow. Uh, and uh, uh, the two good field cases we have come out from uh, the Texas Panhandle. One's a sandstone reservoir, and the other is a carbonate. And, and uh, don't let it fool you, because it's in the states and it's uh, low pressure. That well, that just applies to the Guyman Hugan. It applies to the whole world. Uh, carbonate reservoirs. If you start look, uh, if you start to understand. Uh, I, I talk to geologists about how they're laid down uh, in blanket reservoirs and uh, yeah, cyclical. The, the, the majority of the carbon, uh, in fact, I'll make the general statement all carbonate reservoirs are layered no cross flow reservoirs. Uh, and you should start with the concept of layered no cross flow reservoirs is the rule, it is not the exception. Start with that, and uh, you eliminate uh, a lot of potential disasters in reservoir engineering. And uh, I hope by, by the time we're finished that you uh, realize what to look for in order to identify any well that is backflowing at the bottom of the hole from a production log is it undergoing differential depletion. If it's undergoing differential depletion, there's no cross flow because it can't exist except if there is differential depletion. Okay? Anybody have a problem with that? That's one way of actually detecting it. You know, and you get RFTs on wells, and you go down, and you have different gradients, and they're, uh, they're not on uh, the same gradient. 
you have no cost flow. Now, uh, it, uh, it turns out that, that there's a very uh, simple way of looking at it, that if I take the ratio uh, 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 of a layer's absolute open flow potential over uh, its gas in place or oil in place, uh, and divide that by, uh, let's look at a two-layer system first, uh, uh, by the absolute open flow uh, of the other layer by its gas in place. If that ratio is one, they're going to deplete equally. Even though there isn't any crossflow, it'll behave exactly like a single-layered system. As that uh, ratio approaches, let's say, a number 10, then you're going to have differential depletion, and, uh, and it could be very serious. Uh, you, so you can calculate this ratio on the back of an envelope to try and determine if it's going to be serious. And uh, we'll show you that the difference in forecast you get is dramatic. Uh, in one case you're going to have a disaster on your hands, in the other case you might have an economical situation. But you're obligated as reservoir engineers to run both cases. The cross flow case and the no cross flow. And I'll show you how to do it on the back of an envelope. Now, I'm going to talk about a two-layer system, but you you can convert almost any reservoir number of layers into equivalent uh, two layers. And I'm going to also be uh, sort of talking about a single well. Uh, a multi-well system is just the average well times n, number of wells, or the gas in place of that layer. And, uh, and again, you can do this on the back of an envelope. Uh, I, and I'll show you the difference in forecast is, uh, is substantial. You're obligated to run those cases. We're going to talk about the Red Cave, the Oklahoma Hugot, and, and then I'm going to try and distribute some papers after we have talked about some things to look at. You go through a lot of these old papers published in the 60s and the 70s and start to go through it and you find out uh, uh, the phenomena that, that we're going to discuss, you'll see exists in those papers. Uh, they're layered no cross flow. One of the main things you can do with a reservoir that's layered no cross flow, that has the contrast in properties, is you must stimulate the low permeability layers, or you're going to leave a bunch of reserves in the ground. That's the only control that you have. Uh, and. There's a couple classic papers, one by Shell that was published in the early 70s on a water flood in West Texas. There's a recent one in the oil and gas journal on a reef reservoir uh, in Illinois where even though you may understand that I've got to get the stimulation of the low perm layers, they found that uh, diversion by balls does not work. The only way you're going to ensure that you get it is mechanically. Uh, 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 and I'll point out to you, uh, uh, with Hugoton uh, Field in uh, uh, Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, uh, Phillips and Amico in 1945 were uh, setting uh, bridge plugs between each of the layers uh, and stimulating them individually, mechanically, with uh, a casing and perforating. And we were getting very successful stimulation in 45 before anybody knew about hydraulic fracturing. You know, uh, we got minus five skins in 45. We, uh, we analyzed the data in 89, and the skins are still the same. No problems, no nothing. Uh, uh, again, I'm going to hand you out uh, uh, some papers, and I'm going to also hand you out. This is probably going to be the one that, that uh, uh, is the easiest to look at because uh, 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 I put together these last year. Uh, Dave Reese was uh, uh, taking my place on the SB committee, uh, gas reservoir engineering for the annual meeting, and he got in all the abstracts for uh, for last year. I read through them, and uh, you can begin to see how people are beginning to figure out uh, the layered no cross flow reservoir behavior concepts. Uh, uh, right now, we have an advantage. We have a technical advantage, I think, uh, in understanding this, and we can make a lot of uh, extra money in the competitive situation in the states. Over here, 
if you understand it, you can uh, be able to do two things. You, you have the potential of increasing production and reserves in areas where the low permeability layers have not been stimulated originally. Uh, well, the other is to prevent a disaster in development. If you have layered no cross flow, your production forecast under the assumption of layering, even running with models, is going to be extremely optimistic, or it can be extremely optimistic. A and uh, the way that shows up is you're going to get a decline exponent B of a very high value. The higher the value, the more precipitous the decline in rate with time. You know, when you're starting uh, t equals zero, exponential decline is optimistic. It isn't pessimistic. In a hyperbolic, or the B values of 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, are very pessimistic. I'll show you that. And again, it's real easy. You know, even if you're building a model, run one case, a base case, as a no cross flow case. And again, if your reservoir variables are such that you introduce them all into the model and you run it, and uh, it could be that it won't make any difference, but you're obligated to run it. And uh, I hope to get it uh, to get you to understand also that, in my opinion, the industry is wasting a lot of time in reservoir characterization because they're they're focusing on aerial variation in reservoir property. It's not the aerial that's going to kill you; it's the vertical. And you at least have logs, well logs, you know, to look at there. That. Uh, I, I, again, I hope to show you some examples and we'll go through the discussions where you begin to understand this. And again, uh, I brought a lot of papers that uh, I hope uh, to have reproduced, but I'm going to pass out a certain amount for everybody to kind of go through and read after the second day. And we're going to come in on the, the uh, third day and basically primarily work uh, two problems. Uh, one on gas, this can be uh, uh, layered no cross flow, and the other on uh, oil that, that is going to be layered no cross flow, but we're going to look at the uh, potential of infill drilling. And I'll show you, I can get identical responses, homogeneous uh, aerially uh, with layered no cross flow, uh, that they're attributing 100% to aerial ocean. I'll get the identical response. Which one is it? Well, you, uh, well to me, it's layered no cross flow. I, I, and again, you can look at the data. Uh, so that's what we're going to try and cover. Uh, we'll try and take a 15-minute break uh, uh, in the morning and the afternoon, and I guess uh, about a half hour out for lunch. And. Uh, I would don't be afraid to ask questions again as we're going along. I'll try and answer them uh, as quickly, but we don't want to uh, delay too long. Other than if it's a very important uh, point, we'll uh, we'll take as long as it, uh, is necessary in order to clarify. That's a long introduction without actually seeing anything, but. Uh,